Welcome to another episode of The Woman in You with Zoe, where we celebrate inspiring women who are making a significant impact in their respective fields. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with a woman leading a public relations agency dedicated to elevating the public perception of brands and entities. Her expertise and innovative approach have transformed numerous brands, making her a true leader in the industry. Join us as we delve into her journey, the challenges that she's faced, and the insights she's gained along the way. I'll introduce my guest right after this break. We're super excited today to have a community engagement activity. We have an affinity for fashion, so we decided to host a public relations and fashion masterclass so that these brands can walk away with the tools they need to create their own communication strategy. The hottest designs now are coming from the continent, but the only way people will find out about you is visibility. A big thing about visibility is telling your story. Fashion designers are powerful. You're selling an image, you're selling style, you're selling aspiration, you're selling hope, you're selling so much. So you want to be intentional. You've got to be intentional with your clients. Because when you're intentional with your clients, guess what? You probably won't do any publicity. It's been a wonderful day so far. Well received. Our masterclass was phenomenal. People took down notes. People asked questions, provided input as well. The potential is limitless, it is endless, and we're super excited, and we hope that we come back to you soon with something super, super, super awesome for our creatives as well. Welcome back. My name is Zoe Abube Eduardo, and as I've already indicated, my guest today is into the PR field and she'll be telling us more about her journey. Welcome, Hilary Ando. You're welcome to the woman in you with Zoe. You're welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you? I am doing great as Happy well. Happy to hear. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Likewise. I know you Thank are really you. a busy person, so um, getting you here, it's really a, a pleasure. Thank you so much for honoring our invite. And thank you too for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So just before we delve into HSAPR, which is your company, mm -hmm. um, just tell us something brief about yourself something brief okay who is Hillary where did she grow up where was she born <laughs> who is Hillary Hillary is let me see it's funny I was thinking about it earlier Hillary is a very passionate and intense individual um, I was actually born to my parents Ghanaian parents um, in Washington DC um, and um, when I was younger, I shuffled between um, the two continents, the U.S. and Ghana. Okay. Um, and I actually spent some time in England as well. Um, so I, I say I'm proudly a mutt, but proudly Ghanaian. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right, so you grew up mainly in the U.S.? Yes, mainly in the U.S., but I did spend some time when I was younger in Ghana as well. Um, I had, you know, my parents were shuffling between the two places and at some point my dad moved to Ghana and he wanted me to spend some time with him. So I was here as well, yes. Do you have any fond memories growing up in Ghana? 
Do I have, oh, absolutely. I, my fond memories, definitely with my cousins. So I am an only child. So I have lots of cousins that I spent time with. And I think my fondest memory would be spending time with my dad's older sister, my favorite person, um, favorite person actually, favorite person, who actually was very impactful and influential in my life. Um, I think I, I will attribute, after God, I would attribute a great percentage of who I am to, to her. Phenomenal woman, very well educated, very kind, very gentle, um, very simple, not pretentious, um, very secure in herself, very confident. She wasn't too much, um, well-groomed, elegant, um, and she spoke life into me. Um, mm. Victoria Hughes, that's her name. She truly affirmed me as a woman. Um, she, she always reminded me of my worth, my capabilities, always pushed me to be just a greater version of myself. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Great. So women impacting Absolutely. each other. Absolutely. But why did you decide to come to Ghana? You know, it's funny. I don't have, you know, I don't have that story of, oh my God, I was making a trillion dollars and I decided to move to Ghana. No, no, no. I don't have that story. I, my soul, Truly, I know as ridiculous as it may sound, my soul just wanted to be in Ghana. And I remember my mom, who had had not so pleasant experiences living in Ghana and after she left Ghana, wondering like, what do you want to do? Why Ghana? Like you could do so much here. What do you want in Ghana? And even in the beginning, my dad was like, why? You know, there's so many opportunities. Why Ghana? Why the continent? But my soul just wanted to be here. And that was my why. Wow, quite mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. So just tell us um, schooling, um, basic school, college. Right. So I, I first started in, in DC, um, Washington DC, of course. I did preschool um, in DC, started elementary school, went to Calverton Elementary, which is in Maryland, actually, Maryland, USA, um, and then um, Holy Cross in Maryland as well. And then um, came to Ghana, and I actually, my parents, my dad is staunch Catholic, so I went to Christ the King International School Catholic okay. School for a few years, and then went back to the US, and then came back again. And then when I went back to the US, I went to college, I went to American University, where I studied international studies and economics. And then, of course, when I was younger, I remember, I'm not sure if this show, I'm sure this show is going to date me. It's called LA Law. And I used to watch this show all this time and I thought I was going to be an attorney. So after college, I, I went to um, work at a law firm. I worked in um, three different law firms. I worked at um, Paul Weiss, I worked at Crowell and Morin, and I also worked at um, Patton Boggs LLP because I was sure I was going to be an attorney. And then I quickly found out, of course, the reason I thought I was going to be an attorney was because on TV, you know, they were eloquent, they were speaking, and I thought, you know, this was going to be the life of an attorney. And I quickly found out working with these law firms that it was actually not. It was in the <laughs> mundane, it was in the detail. You're constantly researching, you're constantly writing, you're constantly analyzing. And I quickly found out that lawyers actually, their desire really really is to settle out of court. So I wasn't going to get my day in court like I wanted to. Did it for a while and realized that that was not the space that I wanted to be in. And you know, Washington DC is a very political and corporate environment. So um, very stuffy, but I, I, I truly enjoyed it. So I quickly want, found a way to immerse myself in culture. I was like, oh, you know, I kind of like fashion as well. So I started going to like fashion show. I started going when people were campaigning for, you know, a, a political position. And then I found a gap and I realized that well she has a fashion show but nobody's promoting it for her maybe I can help her so I started by pro bono just assisting people with publicity efforts maybe writing their little spiel for them uh, making phone calls to media houses to see if I could get them a placement on TV if someone was running for a campaign maybe helping them with their speech um, helping them you know basically figuring or crafting their image and at that time I didn't even know what I was doing crafting mm. their image and now you, it is reputation management right it is image shaping um, is publicity for campaigns so really that's how I started and I actually held on to my full-time role whilst I was doing this as well because it started out as just fun and games something to do beyond my corporate life it was just something I'll do just for fun then eventually the demand um, you know basically outweighed my 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 nine to five so I was like you know what this is something that I would want to enjoy full-time so I started doing it people were running for mayoral campaigns helping them with their campaign strategy, helping them identify, you know, language to speak to their populace, helping them identify where they fit in and crafting their image. So it really started 
that, that, mm. that way. I um, started doing it for brands as well. And I decided, you know what, I think I want to do it on the continent. And of course, God, it's obvious I chose Ghana because I'm Ghanaian and I wanted the soft landing in Ghana as well. Yeah. Okay. So how long did you work with the law firms? Oh, I worked for, I've been working, I've been, I mean, I'm not going to give up my age, but I really worked, I started working my first year of college. So I worked for a good 15 years. A good, yeah, I started working really young in life, a good 15 years. So, you, yes. So when people are being coddled, I think I started working just before I turned 18. Whoa. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you didn't like your experience in the law firm? No, I loved it. I loved it. I just started doing something different that I ended up loving more. Yeah. And you decided to pay more attention? Yes, I decided to pay more attention to the space. So at, at what point um, did HSAPR come into mind or at what point did you birth it? So I think after I had been playing around with the different facets of it and I realized, listen, I may, I'm really onto something, um, I decided to formalize it and I formalized it probably after, you know, just navigating the space and doing different things and trying my hand at different things for, I probably played around with it for like a good five years before I formalized it, yes. Here in Ghana? Ghana and in Washington, D.C. Okay, yes. so yeah. tell us about um, PR in Washington, PR in Ghana. So, so, so that's the thing. PR is PR everywhere, right? Um, the appreciation may be different, and I think mm -hmm. appreciation comes from understanding, right? Um, so the, the, the gap may be Washington, D.C., and when I say Washington, D.C., physically in Washington, D.C., but executing for people in the U.S. and elsewhere. So we've had clients in Europe, we've had clients in Asia, we've had clients on the continent. Um, but in, in terms of just bringing it Ghana or bringing it local, um, it, it's funny, um, is it David of Osudote always tells me that the onus is on me, Hillary, to get people to understand the field a little bit Bit more because of course you know as Ghanaians and also broadly as Africans we've always known you know you're either a doctor or an attorney or an engineer so PR is not something that people really paid attention to and now it's a big big industry um, and I think uh, people underestimate the importance of PR globally people are asking um, people in our space in the PR and comm space to have a seat at the table mm. you're sitting with decision makers who are saying listen this is our end goal this is the the vision we have for a company how can we achieve it using in the power of PR and comms and the importance of PR like I said first we figure out what's, what your ethos is as an organization what your objective objective is what your what your raison d'etre is and what, once we figure that out then we figure out okay so this is your objective who's your target audience who are you selling to who are you marketing it to who is your ideal client or customer once we figure that out then we curate language to suit your ideal customer or client then the next step is beyond figuring out how do we how do we get Zoe to buy your product or how do we get, get Zoe to sign on to your service we figure out how do we reach Zoe mm. and that comes with platform what is the platform with which we can um, we can get your target audience so there are some pl different platforms you have the traditional platform so you have print media we have print publication right you have the hard newspaper and believe it or not there are people who still love their newspaper and who still mm. buy magazines and print yeah. so we find that out then we're like okay there's some there's a target audience that's just mainly focused on radio how do we get them on radio and there's a target audience that's big on social media how do we do that as well and then the language for each medium different so you figure out the platform and you figure out the mess the, the language and that is how you reach your target audience before I let you talk a, a little bit about your company mm -hmm. help us understand what exactly you do mm -hmm. so is it that you recruit a number of young people mm -hmm. say um, GIJ which is mm -hmm. now Unimark mm -hmm. where we have people who are specialized in PR right. you pick you pick them mm -hmm. up train them mm -hmm. in your company mm -hmm. or and then throw them out right to various institutions. Right. So say Zoe has a company mm -hmm. and she needs a PR person. Right. Is that person permanently working for Zoe right. or the person is with your firm? Mm -hmm. And then as and when I need you to help me in maybe say I have a crisis right. and I need you to manage it, then I, I, I seek your services. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ordinarily we would employ people they would be in our company, in the company, and there would be staff. Okay. And so you would retain our services. So we're an agency working directly for Zoe. Great. And we have a, an agreement whether it's monthly, and we usually suggest that, let's say, when you have a retainer for PR, to, a campaign to truly be effective, you need 18 to 24 months. So let's say we have an agreement for 18 months where we have a monthly retainer and we are providing that service to you. 
But what happens is that the, go the goal is not, of course, every, I'm sure every agency would love to be <laughs> your agency of choice forever. But for, what, what we do for our clients, some of our clients, is after they've retained us for a while and we have a system in place and we feel like they can take off, we actually train um, employees for them so that they can be their in-house comms person. And occasionally we will check in maybe every quarter, we'll provide a little bit of assistance to the company to help them you know, achieve their comms goal. So, but ordinarily, it is um, retaining these employees and having them work for our agency, yes. Okay, great. So, tell us what you do. Right. Yes, APR. Right. Yeah, so, so yes, the world of public relations. The world of public relations, we offer a gamut of services. So, we offer the traditional public relations, which is basically telling your story as authentically as possible. Um, there's also the field of crisis management. I'm helping you navigate and, and um, navigate your crisis and coming out successful. And we always tell clients, let's not wait until you're in crisis mode. Let's have a PR or comms plan in place before you're in crisis. But unfortunately, this doesn't happen. And usually, <laughs> our first point of contact with a client is when there's crisis, crisis. right? Mm -hmm. And what, we ha what happens, and we have the crisis, and then we have communication strategy. Um, what's your strategy to communicate to your stakeholders or to the audience that you're trying to target? And then we have reputation management. And reputation management is a dicey one. It could be for somebody who has, let's say, it's for maybe Zoe has ambitions in 10 years and she has a, a goal in 10 years. She's like, you know what? Um, Hillary, I desire to be president in 10 years. Can we curate? Can we work on my reputation, to work on my brand, to curate so that come in 10 years, I'm ready for that role? And people don't realize the time it takes to build that. Um, a lot of people usually just sign on, oh, I'm ready in six months. No, it takes a really long time. And people don't realize how subtle PR can be. PR is not just billboards and, and LP, live, live presenter mentions. No, no, no. It is subtle. And a lot of countries use it brilliantly. An example, I must say, whoever is handling the PR for Rwanda is doing chef's kiss a brilliant job so PR is subtle and it is it, over time is done over time for, for the goal so beyond the reputation management so we have media relations of course we need you to be successful in our field so let's say a client beyond the image let's say a client even has a summit right we need to be able to propagate that information so we would have to work with you to figure out okay so channel one TV has different programs we, uh, this is what this is the, the script this is the scope of work that my client demand and this is what I think my client needs. What show should I put my client on? Who's going to interview my client? And is there a way that we can we can ask the questions in such a way that it brings out the vision and the ethos of my client? So we didn't be your relations as well. And there's a field of PR that's also government relations, where you're basically representing your client when it comes to decision makers. You're telling them, listen, this is the field my, my client is in. This is his industry. And so if you're thinking about projects, please have my client in mind. Or my client may be in a country having difficulties. We step in and negotiate on your behalf or even speak to the government on your behalf. Mm. So, so, so there's so many different facets. And even when it comes to events, um, yes, there is a soft skill of putting together an event. But for instance, you're putting together a conference or a summit, one that we've done recently. When, when you go to a brilliant conference, know that PR and comms people have been working day and night to make it brilliant. When you go to a conference and you're so touched and you move, because guess what? They're not just thinking about the aesthetics or your brochures. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, they are handpicking your speakers. Okay. You give a theme, yeah. one, they fine tune your theme. After they fine tune your team, they identify the right speakers. And then they prep your speakers, their mm -hmm. content, um, the kind of questions that they ask, the feel of the event. So these are all the things that the PR industry does. And um, the PR field has actually evolved, evolved and it's a great opportunity. So it has snowballed, especially for us, where after you've had a relationship with a client for a long time, and let's say your client, let's say, was in Ghana or, I don't know, Cote d'Ivoire, and all of a sudden your client decides that, you know what, I'm opening up in Zimbabwe or I'm opening up in Switzerland, um, they come to you because they trust you. They go, one, who should be our point of contact when we go to Switzerland? Mm -hmm. Who's the vendor we should use? Or because they've built a relationship with you, the snowball effects becomes you end up becoming, let's say, a local partner for them. They're like, you know what? We've worked with you for like five years or a decade. We trust you. We want to work in Ghana. We know the laws in Ghana requires that you know, a certain percentage is owned by a local. Can you partner with us with that? Can you be our local rep? So PR is constantly evolving. Evolve. Yes. Yeah. All right. You're still watching The Woman in You with Zoe. My name is Zoe Abube Eduardo, and my guest today is in the PR field, and she's been enlightening us about 
what PR is all about. You know, usually people have a misconception. We'll be taking a quick break here, but when we come back, I'll be asking her, is it so easy for journalists to transition into the PR world or industry? Usually you have journalists leaving the field and wanting to do PR, and then you have people say, oh, it's not the same. We'll be asking her about that. Please stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. You welcome back. This is the woman in you with me, Zoe Abubeid Wado. We've been having really interesting conversation with Hilary Ando, um, my fancy lady. <laughs> Otenden Nyaminado. You speak yes, I'm Fritzwa. <laughs> Fritzwa. Fritzwa, that's my, Irama Fritzwa is my fancy name. But I wasn't born on a, I might as well, Saturday? Saturday, yeah. I wasn't born on a Saturday. I was named after my grandmother. I was born on a Tuesday. So technically, oh, I'm a Rabna Fritzwa. I'm a Rabna as well. Oh, I, love <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, so we're having a really good conversation with her. She's um, demystifying the perception about PR and what it really is about. So before we took the break, I was talking about journalism and PR and how it's even difficult mm -hmm. for students to even choose between PR and journalism. Mm -hmm. Are the two, um, do they work hand in hand? And for instance, I am a journalist. Mm -hmm. If I want to transition into the PR mm -hmm. industry, is it the same? I mean, is it going to be so easy? Because you usually have a lot of people transitioning and they don't do so well in the world of PR. Right. So, so there are similarities, but definitely not the same. You know, journalism is factual. Factual, you're supposed to be objective. Accurate. Um, and accurate and precise and mm. concise. Um, of course, the similarities between journalism and PR is the research angle. People don't realize that it actually takes a lot of research to be really effective in the PR strategy and the comm strategy. So, for instance, at HSAPR, we have people whose main job, focus, sole objective is to just research. They okay. provide us with a, a facts for us to create, to put on the creative element, right? So, yes, yeah, so you can easily, trans I think it's easier to transition from being a journalist to PR because then you've already honed your research skills and we just have to probably help you fine tune in terms of just being more creative and thinking more about the moving parts of a strategy. So, for instance, PR is solution solution driven right and solution driven being solution driven you first have to go back a few steps and think okay so there's so many moving parts what is the problem what am i trying to solve before you come back and put together the strategy whereas in the field of journalism straight research straight fa facts straight precision so i think the transition would not be too bad but i also think that because you're moving from a very almost scientific field of journalism i think it's best if you probably spend a few more years doing the more scientific part before you move into the PR space. But I think it actually would be harder for somebody who starts out in the PR phase to move, transition into journalism. Let's talk about education a bit. So yeah. um, Unimac, right. which uh, formerly was um, GIJ, mm -hmm. so their yeah, specialties, um, PR, we have traditional or print media, mm -hmm. we have broadcast journalism. Mm -hmm. But with broadcast journalism and PR, um, do you think it should both go hand in hand or we should still have the specializations as it stands now right. so that at every point in time I'll be able to um, give off my best when it comes to either way? Right. I, I think it's important to have a, um, to specialize, right? You can specialize, but you can also transition. So with skills such as, so again, broadcast journalism and PR, I think, it was, in my opinion, a PR person will probably transition easier into broadcast journalism versus vice versa. Because in PR, again, you're doing some research, you're writing, you're being creative. You just have to be thought how to carry yourself on screen and be cued to be on screen versus the other way around. Yes. All right. So tell us more about what you do. Um, which or what, who are some of your clients? We know some of the big companies you work for. Do you work for churches? Do you work for political entities? Right. Tell us more about, about that as well. Yes, so um, we do work, we, do, we mainly focus on multinationals and um, we do some work for um, political entities, parties as well. We have worked for that as well. And then also we work for governments as well. Um, that's our focus. Agencies? Um, no, for governments, governments, gov either governments or government agencies, um, political entities, um, political parties, and multinationals. But our oh. focus is on multinationals. Okay, so government, for instance, what exactly do you do? So, for instance, let's say, let's say the government of Ghana 
versus, let me give an example. I mean, and of course, we can't even mention our clients and work we've done because of the confidentiality yes. and sensitivity, but I'm trying to think about what we could possibly do for Ghana. So let me give a clear example. Let's you say, mentioned Rwanda. Yes. So let's say Rwanda. Rwanda is definitely... Um, retaining someone for PR to tell their story, right? The reason we've fallen in love with Rwanda beyond the fact that Kagame may or may not possess great leadership skills is that guess what? They are being intentional about the positive stories they're putting out. Because you're seeing them in the Premier League. It is the intentionality. <laughs> and that's why you've got to be intentional no. with your storytelling. Mm. But I think a lot of people feel like it's not necessary. You, you don't become great by just being. Mm. You've got to be intentional about being great. Think about yourself. If, let's say I want to be the best version of myself, and I say that, oh, I want to be in the absolute best shape. I don't get into my absolute best shape by eating whatever and doing whatever and just being. You've got to be intentional about the steps you take to tell your story. And that is why you, Rwanda it seems to be doing exceptionally well. Yes, there, yes, Kagame, um, President Kagame has great leadership skills, but we wouldn't know that if they weren't telling their story, would we? No. Nope. So the same way that maybe you might go on social media and put out negative stories about yourself, your company, your organization, your government, by doing that, that's your PR for your country. Mm. But then they've taken a step further and they've engaged people. And so PR beyond, let's say, an agency telling your story for you and putting out good stories, part of PR is also who you partner with, um, the platforms you find yourself with. So you mentioned um, something that we're doing recently. Pre the yeah. Premier League. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a way to put out Rwanda. So now visits Rwanda. Absolutely. On, on their absolutely. jerseys. Absolutely. And it's intentional. And they've probably done their research and found out that there are maybe more supporters. They probably looked at Arsenal to my Arsenal fans. Oh my God, I know so many. God bless them. Longevity. They claim they're the most loyal. Um, so they, they've done their research and, and realized that this is a brand to affiliate with. So that's one thing that PR does for you. And they didn't just get up and do that. It took an agency during re conducting market study research and, and engaging people to figure out which brand to affiliate with. Part of what PR does for you is also platforms and conferences. Let's say we're doing, let's say, something called um, executive communications, which is one of the services that we provide for executives, corporate executives, and CEOs. We, we, even if we wanted you to speak at events, we're not going to advise you to speak at just any event. Mm. You've got to be strategic and intentional about the platforms that you put your executives on, and that is exactly what Rwanda is doing. Wow. So who can study public relations? Who can practice public relations? Is this someone who loves talking? Is this someone who is eloquent? Mm -hmm. Who can practice PR? That's a fantastic question, actually. And I think that is usually the misconception. Um, the person behind the desk research and sometimes is not, doesn't even talk. Um, it's, not, it's not about speaking. It's nice if you speak and you're eloquent. So for instance, a facet of PR, um, somebody can hire us to be a spokesperson for, let's say, a brand or a company. And of course, in that sense, being eloquent is great. But it is more about the skills, being a strategic thinker, um, logical reasoning, analytical thinking, right? Analytical skills, critical thinking. Those are the skills required to be a PR person. So really, anyone who possesses those skills and understands the industry can be in PR. So for instance, we have, yes, we have the, 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 the typical PR um, um, team member who studied PR or studied journalism, right? Or somebody who studied communications. But we also have somebody who's a psychology de um, a degree holder. Okay. We have, um, we've, I've worked with engineers. Okay. Um, and, you know, they are solution driven. So the benefit of, you know, solution driven, you know, engineers always look at the moving parts. So they are also critical to, to the world of PR. So anyone who possesses these skills. And, uh, of course, stellar writing skills. You've got to be able to have fantastic writing That's skills. That's a fundamental. But that, I mean, I mean, if you don't have great writing, if you don't like to write yeah. and you don't like, don't like to write and you don't have great writing skills, I don't think you should even consider being in the industry. Mm. Yes. Wow, quite interesting there. Yeah. So um, what have been some of your most rewarding moments in this job? How long have you been doing this? We've been speaking, but you haven't told us um, how long you've been doing this. I've been doing this for, has it been 12 years almost? Like 12 years, yes. Mm. Yes, for 12 years. Wow. Most rewarding moments, I think when, so we had a, there was a U.S. university that um, had planned their first global summit on the continent. 
Um, and when they planned their first global uh, summit on the continent, I think they had um, engaged one of the big, you know, PR, global PR agencies globally. Of course, an agency that will remain nameless, that we plan on being better than one day. They had engaged their services. They had people on the ground as well who were helping. And I think getting to six weeks um, to time, um, we were recommended by a dean from that university to assist. And the most rewarding part of it was, um, I think for us, it was a reminder that you know, local context is important and um, being a niche or a boutique firm has its plus because what we were able to do for them since they were coming to the continent is look at their theme or the objective for their summit and identify and pair them with the right speakers across continent. It was one of our most rewarding moments. And it was also rewarding because this is an institution that could pick or choose any agency globally, but they chose us, that was rewarding. And we also had a government that reached out to us to put together a stakeholder engagement when they had experienced xenophobic activities in their countries. So we had to bring together different immigrants in their countries who were like big, you know, great business, business owners who are really contributing to their society, um, engage them in a room, have conversations, make sure that media was present, um, um, organize um, journalists to question them as well, and also make sure that, you know, they were getting the right mentions in the press, putting together um, different um, channels and platforms to cover the event as well, and making sure they got the numbers and the trend that they needed because as a country, it was a big deal for them. Mm. Um, another uh, moment was just advising, um, I'd been an, an advisory for a few oil and gas companies that were in trouble against, it was a combination of government relations issues where they were probably affiliated to a different party and there was a transition in government and there was a new party and they knew there was a lot of stake because they had done you know, certain things they weren't supposed to do and they were worried about protecting their business and their assets. So those were some of the things. Um, we've had instances where uh, maybe a company had maybe engaged a very big firm and things weren't working and then come to us and we're able to deliver. So that's exciting. That must or, be really rewarding. It, it is rewarding. And interestingly, sometimes we, like I said, the snowball effect where people are like, okay, you've done PR for us. We met you when we're in crisis. Crisis mode is over. You've done PR for us. Help us identify opportunities where we're able to say, you know what, I think if you've been in Ghana and you've been in Switzerland, maybe you want to look at Côte d'Ivoire and you know, leveraging the network and the contacts to be able to access government on that side for them, identifying spaces where they can actually bid for projects, um, you know, find the stakeholders in the environment that could help them you know, put together a successful proposal and win their bid. So, so those things are, are very rewarding. You know, previously there was this, or there's this, still this misconception, PR, usually we have the woman at the forefront. Right. Is there still a woman-centered, um, how do you call it, uh, industry? Well, there, there are a lot of women in the field, but I think most of the owners tend to be male. There are a lot of women, but I think women are, you know, taking over all spaces. So, you know, women are extremely special. What can I say? Mm. And so who should engage the services of a PR um, company? Is it a small startup? Must everybody have I mean, engage the service of a PR, even when you are as small as just starting, mm -hmm. say, today, right. or it, just the multinationals right. and the big firms right. that we have. So Bill Gates... What, what would be your recommendation? There's a quote by Bill Gates that says that if I was down to my last dollar, I would spend it on public relations. Um, everyone, um, that is, you're an SME, you're a startup, um, MNC, you're a politician, you have political ambitions, and this is not just running for presidency. You have political ambitions later in life. You're, a you're an executive of a corporate, you're a CEO, um, and let's say you want to present yourself in a certain way. So beyond just your company, um, you're engaging the, uh, your services for your company. Um, the CEO or, or an executive should engage a PR agency for their brand and for their image and for their reputation. It's unfortunate that um, a lot of businesses, and I find that especially on the continent, when people start a business, usually they never think about PR or mm. comms. They're thinking about who can handle my payroll, who's the finance person, and then who's my CEO, and that's about it. And it's only after a while where they hit a roadblock that they think, oh, the PR or comms might be effective. But it's like an afterthought. But your PR or comms person, wherever you are, should be at that table when you're drawing up your strategy and vision. Because when they understand your strategy and vision, they can help you put together a strategy that would help you meet or realize your bottom line. Bottom line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Has social media changed the the landscape of mm. public relations? Right. Because social media has changed a lot right, of things. Right. But I, I think yes and no. So social media, I think, is a powerful tool to get an information out there. And it's for a certain demographic. Um, my dad is not on social media. So if you're trying to target somebody in my father's age range, if, if your entire um, strategy is social media, you're, you're bound to fail. So there is a particular demographic that probably utilizes social media and is great. And whilst we're on there, you know, there's this influencer effect now. Um, influencers are great, but people have to realize that you can, let's say, employ an inf influencer. There might be an influencer that has 5,000 followers and an influencer that has 4 million. Depending on the kind of influencer, the one who has 5,000 followers might turn around more sale for you than the 4 million. Because again, it boils down to your target audience. Mm -hmm. If you're 5,000, the person with the 5,000 followers has followers that are your target audience, you will sell more than someone who just has numbers and can't turn it around for you. You get views, you get likes, but views on likes don't translate into sales always. Wow. Yeah. So we're having a great conversation with Hilary Ando, and she's in the PR industry, and she's been walking us through what PR is, what her company does, and some of the she hasn't mentioned names, but some of the multinationals that she's um, worked for and how PR is very important in our day-to-day -day lives. So basically, um, you are a woman, you are in this industry, and I know a lot of women do not like being asked how they are able <laughs> right. to manage their day-to-day -day life and then balance it to the mm -hmm. work. Because you are the CEO right. of your company, how easy or difficult is it managing right. such a big firm and then your day-to-day -day life as well? Oh my God, I mean, I, I must say though, um, what my, the blessing in having a company personally for me has been that it has totally drawn me closer to God. Um, it is the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, as in gut-wrenching, heartbreaking on a regular thing I've ever had to do in my life. Wow. Is, it, I, is it with the people? Is it with managing the people? It is with everything. It is in driving business for your company. It is in business development. It is in the fact that you want to hold on to your principles and values and do things the right way. It is in everything that you do. And so that, that difficulty, in a way, has been, a, like I said, it's been a blessing. It's, it's forced me to draw closer to God. And I always say that, honestly, my business strategy is prayer and my relationship with God, I can't even begin to express in words the challenge it is running. Um, I know people see, let's say on a day like this, we're glammed up and we're glamorous, but this is not the everyday thing. It is in daily thinking while, how do I drive business? How do I sustain my clients? How do you constantly remind people that you're capable of delivering? Um, so you have people, let's say, in this industry, and especially, I'm not just saying just because I'm a woman, in this industry, in this field, especially PR, because people feel like it's not a tangible. So we are in an environment and a continent that values tangibles more than services, right? It's easier for someone to pay for a bottle of water than, than it is for them to pay for strategy. So you sometimes have your, your constant battle is someone telling you things like, oh my God, you know what, Hillary? Um, there's this amazing company, but how about this? How about maybe you do something for them for like three months or six months for them to see how great you are before, you know, maybe you can get them to, to, to sign on to your services. So you're constantly battling that and you're constantly battling with, you know, trying to just, you know, prove your worth, prove yourself. And then you have the, to deal with the issue of a woman, right? You're dealing with decision makers and some are scrupulous and some are not. So it is in the constant battle. And it is also in having to motivate your team members to see the vision, to, the drive to deliver, um, to, to, to just get them to imbibe your, your passion and your intensity and, and your vision and your dream. Mm -hmm. So it is a constant, constant battle. So prayer is great. It, it, for me, I mean, that, that's it. That's my ultimate strategy. And then, um, uh, thanks to stress, I'm also forced to constantly um, physical exercise. I do a lot of it. Like I spend, I think I, I exercise five days a week. If I'm not walking, wow. I'm lifting weights, I'm doing yoga, Pilates, because you've got to keep sane, right? So you have all these things going on and you're, you don't want to lose your mind. So you got to hold on to Jesus on, on the right hand and then exercise and eat well, because it all affects you, right? Um, even the foods that you eat. Um, I, I don't think I could be performing at a certain level if I was eating junk. So being mindful of the things that I eat as mm -hmm. well. And also just holding on to hope, right? You hold on to your vision and, and knowing that eventually 
eventually things will get better. I mean, God is a kind God. He's not going to allow you to spend 12 whatever years building something and, and sacrificing your, 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 your savings and your, your education, all of that, and what you feel. And, you know, you can only try, right? Um, it will get better. Um, you don't despise small beginnings. Things do get better. And, you know, when I look back, of course, I'm talking about challenges, but God has been gracious. I, I'm, I'm, I'm cons consistently in awe of the spaces that I've been blessed to walk in, the kind of access that I have, the kind of network that I have, I know that it's only by his grace because you're like, I just started this you know, fun and games and now yeah. this is very serious and I find myself in the presence of these people and I find myself, you know, people recommending our company and all of that, but it is a constant battle and I think you just, you just become a bit more resilient um, and you just grow a bit more and then there's grit and you just keep pushing. Um, you know, there are days where you cry a little, but you eventually have to stop crying, right? Yeah. And then you just keep moving. So but as it is now, uh, is it a very competitive industry? You know, it is competitive, but I think when you have your niche, for me, I, you know, it's funny, I get asked that question, who's your competitor, is it competitive? No, because, you know, I have a focus and I have a niche. So for us, it is really not. And also, because I run my business, it may, may not be the best way. I don't think this one was taught in MBA school. So I run my business based on my personal principles and values. So I take on projects that align with my personal principles and values. Um, we've turned down um, certain politicians because it just didn't align with my personal values, right? Okay. So, so yes, it may not be the smartest way, but it is our way. Um, so, so for me, it's not... Yeah, it's not competitive. I, I don't find it competitive. I mean, there are people who are doing, you know, great numbers, numbers that we could only dream about, right? But because it's principle and value based, and the thing about principle and value based is that you will struggle, right? So you've got to decide, you know, you're walking away from this amount. I remember once I said, Jesus, I know you did not bring me this far to do this, so I'll just walk away. And at some point, I know you make provision. And of course, you walk away. It's not that easy. And then months later, you're like, really? Did I just walk away from that? I could have done this. I could have, you know, we could have been in a new space. I could have hired three but more people. But why would you walk away from such huge sums? Um, principles and values. So you've got to, I think, for you to be successful. And I think it should be a guiding principle for everyone. You really, one, have to know who you are. And, and, and know what is important to you. So if certain principles and values are important to you, it actually makes choosing very easy. Mm -hmm. That this deal comes in front of you, you're like, eh, this person is up to no good, I don't want to be a part of it. And it's funny, um, sometimes I listen to the news and things happen, I'm like, wow, I'm so glad I walked away because we could have been marred by that. So a good name is always better. And eventually, um, it's difficult, but I've realized that We've, we've had so many no's and we've walked away from so many things. But guess what? Eventually it comes full circle. The no's end up turning into yes and then bigger doors open. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Great. You're still watching The Woman in You with Zoe Abube Eduardo. Uh, my guest is Hilary Ando and we're having a great time here. We'll take a, another break here and when we come back, I'll be asking her about the money. Is it... <laughs> expensive mm -hmm. to hire someone in the PR industry. She'll be mm -hmm. telling us more about that. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. You welcome back to The Woman in You with Zoe. Really having some great conversations, talking to women who are shattering glass ceilings and making an impact in their field of work. And I've been speaking with Hilary Andor, who is the CEO of HSA PR. And as I indicated, I'm going to ask her, how expensive or otherwise it mm -hmm. is to engage the services of someone in the PR industry. Tell us about it because you're making it sound so good. I'm really convinced that if I even start a business right now, mm -hmm. I should engage mm -hmm. the businesses of someone in the PR space. But is it affordable? You know, I think affordable is relative, right? It's what's important to you, right? So you go to a shop, you want a dress, you see something you like and you pick it up. So it's relative, and you do it according. So does it mean you have packages? So there are packages, but the cost of a retainer, honestly, is dependent on so many factors. The scope of the work, the number of people and the expertise of people you're staffing, and the longevity of the project, right? The duration of the project. So what happens usually is some people are like, no, no, I only want it for six months. Like I said, um, if somebody is, decides to put together a strategy for you for just six months, you should be really skeptical and weary. The most effective campaign strategies last for a minimum of 18 months. So when it's 18 months, of course, then it means that your monthly retainers may be lower. But then if you insist and it's six months, then it's higher. So it depends on the scope of work, who you're staffing. So you might be staffing a project where, let's say, 
I'm on and I have a billable rate, right, per hour. There might be a researcher on there, there might be a manager on there, and there might be an account executive on there. So the scope, the duration, and the type of the project. So let's say average retainer. So let's say there's a retainer where there's so much work that, let's say you're spending four billable hours a day on it, so times five, that's 20 a week, right? Times four is 80 hours a month. So based on that, that would you know, determine the monthly retainer. But if it's half of that, it's 40 or a third of that. So it depends on the scope of the project and the type of work that's being done. Are you willing to share with us what the range? Oh, I mean, <laughs> ranges vary. So again, it depends. So either you're doing, let's say, PR where you're storytelling. And if you're storytelling, it depends. I mean, PR or you're doing crisis management or you're doing reputation or you're doing, um, what do you call it, executive communication. It's a mixed bag, right? So if it's crisis, I mean, it can range. I mean, some people have retainers. Like I said, there's a, there's a dream um, uh, organization where they have retainers into the millions of dollars, but some of them also start on a very low end of, let's say, um, what, let's say 50,000 CDs per month, right? So it depends. Some will say 50,000 CDs a month, some will say 100,000 CDs a month, or some will say 200,000 CDs a month. And like I said, some go as high as, you know, there are countries that are paying as much as, let's say, what, 10 million CDs? Is that a million dollars now per month? Yes. Wow. Yes. The countries that are paying that much just for their PR campaign. Yes. Because for them, their return, again, it's about your return on investment. So the country that is paying, like I said, whoever is handling Rwanda's uh, PR <laughs> chef's kiss, I wish I were them. <laughs> like, if they're being paid a million dollars a month, it is worth everything because their return on their investment, that one million they're paying is generating hundreds of millions of dollars. Every conference is, is taking place there. Everything is happening there. People are moving everything there. So... It depends on what's important to you. Great. Right. So what advice will you give to that young woman watching this show right now who wants to um, start something in PR or who wants to delve into the PR and that she will be your advice to that woman or young lady watching you right now? Um, know that it won't be easy, but it will be worth it. So just brace yourself for the ride because it's an arduous ride but it is rewarding and fulfilling especially when you look at what you're able to achieve um, and you look at your roster and you look at your profile sometimes somebody will ask us for a company profile and you look at it and they respond they're like wow those are some amazing creds and you're like oh okay yes we've done some stuff um, and I'll just say hone your skills just focus on your education study really hard and Figure out what your principles and values are and what's important to you. That was, that's what I would say. Finally, what legacy do you hope to leave in the PR space when Hillary is in her old age and right. she sits back right. and she crosses her leg? What legacy would you hope to, to leave? A legacy of passion and excellence. That's it. And in my personal life, a legacy of love. I want to be remembered for just being love, exuding love, giving love, but in terms of PR, a legacy of excellence and passion. And this is something that you want to do till you retire? I think so, but you never know. You never know. You never know. You never know. We'll you see. spoke about fashion. We didn't speak about that. Yes. Tell yes. me more, uh, just a little about your fashion. So, so yes, yeah, so uh, I said I like fashion, and part of what we do, thank you for asking that, um, because we focus, we decided as a strategy, even though initially we used to do MS, M, uh, SMEs and small businesses, we segued from that, like, let's say, eight years ago into focusing on multinationals and governments. Um, and so what we do, because we like fashion, by giving back, last year we had we did a community engagement with fashion brands in Ghana. So because we know that maybe those brands cannot afford our services or maybe don't understand our services, we put together a master class for um, fashion okay. brands where we taught them how to curate or craft their own communication strategy okay. and tell their own story so they can create visibility and awareness for their brands. So that is what we do for the fashion space. And in fact, last year we came up with the first state of the Ghanaian fashion industry report. We decided to research the industry to see what the challenges are. So that it's a one-stop shop report for people who want to better understand the Ghanaian fashion industry and see how they can, they can uh, impact it and help that industry. And in fact, we're actually doing that again this year. We are surveys out. We're asking people 
people who own fashion brands and in that space to answer because when we did the first one, we got a bit of interest. And what we want to do for fashion in, in, in Ghana and beyond the continent is to get people to invest. And we realized that a lot of the confusion comes from non-existent knowledge, right? So a lot of investors want to invest in the space but don't know where to start. So we decided that we'll have this survey again put together a report so it becomes a one-stop shop so that if an investor picks up this document, they know what brands are doing what, who okay. needs partnerships, who wants to stay up, who needs investment, and who needs collaboration. Yes. Okay, so well, there are a lot of designers out there. Right. There, are lo there are a lot of people right. who are delving because right. now it's making a lot yes. of money. Yes. People need sponsorship. Right. Yeah. Are those the kind of um, people you, you're talking about? So I have a small shop yeah. where I design clothes. Everyone. Everyone. Okay. So the idea is to get Fashion brands, whether you just started or five years or 10 or you've been doing it for 20 years, because we, we, we want investors to understand the space that let's say Zoe has a brand. She started two years ago and this is her vision and these are her challenges. And from that report, what we found out that we have a problem of, um, let's say, technical skills, right? We have people who need help with making patterns. We have a quality control problem. We have an issue. We don't have a garment district in Ghana. We have an issue of manufacturing. If, let's say, a brand, an established brand, got an order for even 100,000 pieces, they couldn't turn around the order in six months because we don't have the capacity. So these are things that investors would like to know. And, and for us, part of doing this report is also to affect policy. We hope that after our second report, we can submit it to, let's say, government decision makers. Not for government to, let's say, take over the industry, but to partner with the private sector to see how that industry and the field can be developed. Because, you know, we talk about unemployment, but a lot of these brands are, are providing food on tables. They're employing people, right? So it's a way to solve some of our unemployment issues. I must really commend you for a great job you're doing. Thank you. And really inspired by what you're doing. Thank you. And I must say that I wish you all the best. Thank you. And hope to see you at the top. Amen. I mean, you're already there. So but... shall it be. So shall it be. So... <laughs> Thank you so much for honoring our invites today. Thank you. And it's a pleasure speaking with you. That was Hilary Ando. She's the CEO or Chief Executive Officer of HSAPR. And we have been having a great conversation today on The Woman in You with Zoe. I believe and hope that you've had a great time, as I have, and at least picked up one or two things. And if you are out there hoping to start something in PR, well, you have it all there. My name is Zoe Abube Eduardo, and I am your host for The Woman in You with Zoe. Till we meet again next time, do enjoy the rest of our programming.